Ladies and gentlemen, up next, we are going to be uh, discussing debugging Nagios plugins with Jet, uh, Jess Portnoy, uh, Packaging Lead and Technical Community Manager with Kaltura. Hi, everyone, and thank you for joining the session and the Nagios conference in general. Uh, I'll be talking about how to debug uh, Nagios plugins, which is the dirty part of working as a sysadmin. Uh, it's not usually spoken about, and I think it's an important topic. Uh, as I go along, I'll also show uh, real life situations where everything is effed up and how to fix it. Uh, and we're going to do that live uh, during this session. So without further ado, this pretty much says what I've just said. <laughs> and uh, basically, there are a few very common reasons for why something wouldn't work. So one thing is file permissions, and the other one would be networking issues of various sorts. Uh, another option would be missing dependencies, binary dependencies. If our plugin is uh, written in, let's say, C or C++, that's quite possible that we'll be missing sh some shared libraries. And then there's a massive amount of additional weird problems, uh, which we'll see some of them uh, as we move, as we advance. Uh, so let's continue. These are some of the tools that we'll be covering during the session. So one of them is the Capture plugin, which I'll be showing. Uh, that basically allows you to easily debug what Nagios is running uh, and get the actual arguments for the command so that you can then run it from the shell and, uh, for further debugging. Uh, S-Trace, which is system call trace. That's a very important tool, uh, especially when using binaries, uh, pre-compiled plugins. Uh, where you can't just open the source code and put in debug prints uh, unless you want to recompile the plugin. Uh, there's Telnet, which is an amazing client, really. I mean, it's a terrible, terrible server-side protocol, which you should never use. But as a debugging tool from the client end, it's an amazing tool that can really help you out quite a bit. Uh, there's Nmap, which we'll uh, also see, which is uh, short for network map, and a very useful tool when uh, debugging networking issues. Netcat, which uh, is like the Swiss army knife of uh, networking utilities, can do a lot of things, and we'll see one usage that I find to be particularly useful. Uh, there is also CRL, which is very good for uh, browsing stuff from your shell, basically, requesting web pages and then analyzing the output. And we've got LDD, also a useful tool for resolving uh, binary dependency problems. So in this demo, we'll debug a few malfunctioning plugins and, in general, a malfunctioning environment. I've basically installed a pretty vanilla Nagios and kind of messed it up so that we'll have fun together. Uh, the first scenario we'll handle is the web interface failing to load altogether. Then we'll have a problem sending emails. Once that's done with, uh, our MySQL check will fail. And then we'll handle a host which blocks ICMP and therefore appears to be down on the Nagios web interface. And as a dessert, uh, we'll check uh, a problem where uh, checking the certificate for, uh, for validity and expiry date actually returns the wrong SSL certificate information. So we should have fun. Oh, oh my. <laughs> Hold on. That was fast. It was the fastest presentation I've ever done. <laughs> Uh, so this is an image I like to embed in most of my presentations uh, because everything that relates to debugging, this is like a line that always comes through. It worked fine in the other development environment and, well, I don't know what happened. So This would hopefully help you uh, with uh, development environments to begin with and then also with production environments, tfu, 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 poo, poo, if you ever have a problem. Okay. So... Uh, seeing how it's a live demo, we'll actually go on to a Nagios web interface here. And we'll get this. Uh, if we open up a sniffer, we'll see that this is basically HTTP 500. We can also see that using our lovely CRL utility, which was covered just a second ago. Uh -huh. So let me just do this, and I'll do minus I to just get the headers, and minus V for verbose. And if I, sorry. If I open this in a browser, then I'll see that this is 401 unauthorized. Why is that? Because we're using authentication. So we can pass on uh, the 
the username and password to CRL, but I'm not going to do that at the moment. So what do we do when this happens? First thing we want to do is find out where the Nagis Apache configuration resides. Uh, this can be done by grabbing the configuration files, but a nicer method, uh, which, is not, which is something not everyone knows, is uh, the Apache actually extends quite an API from the command line, which allows you to see quite a few things about it. Uh, one thing that it can do is this. It can dump the vhost configuration. So instead of grabbing all these configuration files and trying to guess at where they're at to begin with, you can just use this API and it'll output all the virtual hosts that I have, the ports that they're listening on, and so forth and so on. And the default server, uh, I can deduce from the fact that, uh, sorry, from the fact that my Nagus instance is running on port 8082, that, and from the lovely name Nagus Conf, that this is my configuration. And it tells you where the vhost declaration starts, which is this thing here, line two. So looking at this, I can see that we have auth user file, and the authentication type is basic. I don't know if everyone knows this, but Apache is capable of doing LDAP authentication as well, and multiple other uh, methods of authentication, plus you can always extend it. But for this demonstration, we'll be using a very simple uh, off file, well, also called htpasswd file. So as we can see here, this is the file that is being used. And for some reason, something's not working. Uh, let's try and look at the default log, because I can see that in, in this uh, in this vhost configuration, we don't have any custom log handlers. That means that it'll go to the default error log, or any error that you'd get, including that uh, HTTP 500. So let's find that log. Again, we can use the API, because if you do this, you'll see that you can also dump the running configuration. This API uh, was, uh, unlike the dump vhosts, which exists in uh, Apache 2 and above, this one was introduced in Apache 2.4. So if you have an earlier version of Apache, you'll, you'll actually have to use different means to get that, uh, which I'm actually covering, uh, seeing how it's not nice to put all these commands in a presentation. I created this GitHub model, uh, which basically includes all my presentation commands and explanations and so forth and so on. So you can always copy off of that later on. Uh, it's also in the resources part of the presentation, and the presentation itself is also committed to it. So you're welcome to it. Uh, returning to our nice little problem here, so we said that we can do this, and this one is very strong because it shows you the actual runtime configuration and not just the compiled one. That one existed in previous versions of Apache. You could do Apache minus uppercase V, and you'd get the configuration values at, config at the compilation time. But these can easily be overridden in the configs, so that doesn't help much. This one is way more powerful, and I can see that we have this error log right here. So let's open it up and scroll down. And sure enough, last line is our actual problem. The problem here is that permission denied on this password file. And hence, Apache cannot continue further and logging you in to the interface. So let's try and understand why that is. Looking at the runtime configuration, we see that Apache is run by user dub 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 data with the ID of 33. Uh, so let's see the file permissions for this uh, htpasswd file. Um, can, I, can everyone see okay? Should I increase uh, the font perhaps? I, is this better? Okay, lovely. Uh, so looking at this, we can see that someone was really feeling into security and put in 600, meaning only root user can read and write to the files and everyone else can't do squat about it. That would explain our problem because while Apache is launched as root, uh, once it's, it's started, it forks uh, using lower privileged users. This is a security measure, of course. And we can easily see that if we do something like this. So as you can see here, I, I like using this notation, these flags, because it shows the relations between Apache and the children. 
So uh, this one is the parent process, and it's running as root. And all the children, which are the ones accessing that, trying to access our HTTP password file, are running as dub dub data, which is the same thing we've seen when running the run uh, configuration, the Apache API. So uh, to make long story short, in order to fix this, we'd like to uh, group the file and provide dub dub data as group. That's one step. And then we want to do ch mode and provide read-only privileges on that file. We don't need any write privileges, and that's important to note. You don't want to give two promiscuous um, permissions to the file. Now, there is another problem. I did say that my presentation is going to touch slightly on, on security, so it will. Uh, can anyone uh, think of a problem with this line now? I mean, naturally, yes, you need to allow Apache to read the file, but the actual problem with this statement is that the file resides on the HT doc. This is very bad, and why is this so terribly bad? Because that would allow me to do something like this and see all the usernames. Now, granted, it's encrypted. The password is encrypted, but you don't want to allow anyone that information. Uh, one thing you can do about that is that you can use HT access uh, to block viewing of this file, but my preferred method is to put it outside of the document root altogether. It's safer that way. So what I'm going to do, I've pre-commented this one to save us some time, and I'm just going to do this. And then, of course, you have to re one has to reload the Apache, like so. And let's take a look at that file's permissions before we move on. You can see that this one is also not good. Why? Because, uh, well, no, actually, the permissions are proper. So it's owned by root. It has read-write for root, which is necessary, of course. And it has read-only for dot, dot, data. That is the Apache user. So we should be all set. Let's see. Firstly, this one shouldn't work anymore, but it's cached. Oh, I mean. Sorry, it's not that it's cached, it needs to be removed, actually, because we changed the path in the Apache config, but we haven't deleted the file. So let's do that. Just uh, now that the purpose of doing this is completed. And now I won't be able to get to it anymore, because it'll reside outside the document root, which Apache has no access to. OK, lovely. So now we have our Nagus interface, which is nice. This is our first problem, and it's solved. So congratulations, everyone. <laughs> uh, let's move on to the next problem. So I've prepared a particularly dysfunctional environment right here for your amusement. And you can see a lot of you know, Christmas light style display. A lot of things are just malfunctioning. Considering how few services there are, it's really fucked up. I hope they don't, don't record that. OK. <laughs> So um, let's, let's start by trying to reschedule the test. Just, you know, maybe something happened, and now it's, it's looking slightly better. Uh, let's try to commit a test. That one passed through OK. Now, let me ruin it, because apparently I've ruined it and forgotten to re-ruin it. But uh, the scenario that I wanted to show, actually, was a scenario in which uh, the Apache user cannot access the command file. The way Nagus's web interface talks to the backend, to the, the daemon, is through this pipe file. Okay, this is a name pipe or a FIFO. And this one is used by the, the web interface and then is pulled from the daemon. Uh, that one requires the uh, permissions to include the user that the Apache is running with or the group. Uh, as you can see here, it actually has Nagius and Nagius. So why does it actually does work? The reason it works that well is because top, top, da, da, you can see that you have read-write permissions for the group, which would be Nagius. And if you look at this, you'll see that uh, the top, top data group also has Nagius. So that, that's the reason why it would work. If I revoke that permission, uh, let's say by editing the, the group file directly even, but better to use uh, the API. 
So let's revoke that for a moment. Just gonna get rid of that altogether. And presumably, if I load Nagus now and Apache, let's, let's load everything up, I shouldn't be able to reschedule a test. There we go. So that's the scenario I wanted to show from the beginning. And uh, resolving that would, would be just adding the group as I've shown here. Don't worry about writing these commands down because, again, the GitHub page has all of them, so I, I did you a little service and saved you the trouble. Okay, so that was our problem. Now the uh, web interface can write to that file. Uh, an interesting way to debug such things, by the way, apart from doing uh, a less on the file, is to uh, temporarily allow the shell for the NACUS and DubDub data users. Uh, by default, as you can see here, they're bin false, that's their shell. Or bin no login, it doesn't matter, it's the same thing. Uh, the reason for that is plainly because they don't need to log into the system. And it's insecure to allow what is not necessary. But sometimes it's very beneficial to do something like this. And I'll do the same thing for DubDub data. So what I'm doing now is commenting the original entry and just saying that they do have shells. They have bin bash. That would allow me to do stuff like su into it. And then I can check things like whether or not I can actually reach something, like, for example, the command file uh, with the name pipe that we've mentioned. So I can easily do this. and see that I can reach it uh, as dubdub data. When revoking the permission, the, the group permission, I wouldn't be able to do that, and then we'd get the error that we've gotten before. Uh, I'm actually gonna leave the shell for these two users because uh, it's gonna help us later on when trying to run commands as the Nagus user. Uh, in my examples, you'll see that sometimes a command can run perfectly well from the root user, for example, or any other user, and fail on, on the Nagus one. So it's quite important for, for you to uh, test the commands using the actual Nagus user or the Apache user, depending on context, and not just as root. Uh, and we'll see several examples when that ha where that uh, makes a difference. So we checked the user in group, and we added the proper one. Uh, I want to make a note that you can also use Apache ITK. Uh, that's a different NPM, different than uh, pre-fork and the, uh, the worker, which is the event-threaded one. Uh, the nice thing about Apache ITK is that it allows you to run each and every vhost using a different user, which they, the regular Apache does not. So in that case, you could have uh, Apache run a vhost called Nagus under the user Nagus. And then you wouldn't need any permission play at all, because it'll just be running under the same user as the daemon is. So that's another alternative which you can use. Uh, Apache ITK uh, is available in uh, Debian and Ubuntu by default. Uh, for, um, for RHEL, CentOS, and all these uh, RPM friends, you'll have to compile it, because the default is only pref work. Actually, it doesn't even include the, event, uh, the, the, the worker one. Uh, so that's just uh, a side note. Okay, so good, uh, we've finished that, and for some odd reason, despite the fact that our interface shows a completely dysfunctional system, we haven't gotten any emails at all, uh, which is uh, not what we want, really, because uh, unless you have a dedicated knock person all the time, you would ideally like to receive those alerts. So, reasons why that could be. Uh, one reason is very simple, notifications are not enabled for that service. You can see that in the configuration file, I'll, I'll show you where. Uh, but that's usually not the cause. Uh, another reason uh, would be uh, that the, the sending 
is failing for some reason. Uh, now, as Trevor explained before, basically, uh, and we'll see that in the configuration, I'll be showing it step by step, what happens is that uh, the mail utility is used to send the emails. Uh, what happens is the mail utility basically looks for an MTA, a mail transport agent, listening on that machine. Uh, it'll us usually be listening on localhost uh, on port 25 TCP. And then it just passes the message along to it. That's, that's basically all it does. And we'll see uh, a scenario where that is not working correctly. So the first step would be to make sure that our MTA is running. Let's do that. Uh, we can easily do that by running netstat plnt and grepping for port 25. So as you can see here, I have uh, a process called master, which is the postfix name the, the main process for postfix. And that one is actually listening on all interfaces and it's listening on port 25. So that's good. And there's another entry here for um, IP version six, as you can see. So that's, that's a good start. That looks okay. Uh, next thing we would wanna do is go to the Nagus error log and try to understand what, what command is it using to send the email. So let's see. Uh, let's see if we have any mail alerts here. Okay, here we go. So it is calling something called notification service by email. Let's try and understand how that command works and then we can debug it a bit. So I'm just going to grab my Nagus configuration directory to find out where it's defined. And I can see that it's defined over here. Sorry, over here. Okay, so here's my command. Uh, I, I suppose most of you are familiar with basic Nagus configuration by now, so it's very easy to read. That's the name of the command. What it does, it uses printf outputs all the information like so, so Nagus, notification type, this is substituted by actual values at runtime, of course, host name, state, and so on and so forth, and the magic happens here, because it's piping it to the mail utility uh, aforementioned, using minus s for subject, and then the actual alert, and this is replaced by the actual email addresses that you're sending the alert to. All righty, so let's try to run the mail utility from the command line. We'll start by even trying to run it as root. Let's try to run that. So I'll just put Linux 012 and I'll send it to my email address. And all right. I wonder if I got anything. I did, but not from Nagus. Okay. So let's take a look at the mail log. Uh, MTAs would log the information and the errors to, any, to, to a log depending on the system where you're working. So for me, I'm, I'm working with uh, Debian, which it's the same with Ubuntu, and it'll log, the, log it into mail.log. Uh, if you're working on a, an RHEL-based system, the default would be like this, just minus the dot. Uh, it's quite similar. You can just, you know, do an NLS on var log, it'll be there somewhere. So let's open it up and see what the problem is. Okay, so here we are. Uh, let's look at it. This is the one I tried now, and it is saying that it bounced, and the reason why it bounced is invalid mail from address provided. Now, I'll tell you why. Uh, my setup does the, a very simple thing. It uses Postfix to relay that email onto the Amazon SMTP server. Uh, you can deduce that from looking at this host here, which is Amazon. Now, when you use Amazon for, for mail relay, you have to send from particular specific email addresses. This is meant to reduce spam, I suppose. If someone gets your password for the account, they still can't send anything from whatever email they'd like to send, they have to send from a particular email address. So this is our problem. 
the way to solve it, well, there are multiple ways of solving it, but one of the nice ways is to uh, tell Postfix that every email that comes from a particular address should be actually sent as a different one. Uh, and I'll do that right now. Uh, this may vary depending on the <coughs> sorry, depending on the MTA you're using, but Sendmails supports the, the same thing. So basically, any modern day MTA should function the same way. It'll be a slightly different syntax, but you can Google it up. It's not a problem. So for a postfix, what you do is you type in the email address that uh, is at the original, i.e., for example, this. And then you type in the address you want it to be mapped to and sent as. In my example, the service, uh, the Amazon service expects me to send from community to recom. So I'm just going to do this. Then you need to generate uh, a hash for it. This is just the way Postfix works, but um, this is uh, Postfix specific and the session is not, so I'm not going to delay with that. I'm just you know, giving you some comments. And then I need to restart my daemon, of course. And now, actually, what should happen is sending as root would fail, but sending as nagius will not. Let's try it. So send it as root. We can see in the log again that it failed. Okay, here we are, blah, 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 a lot of stuff, failed. Now, here. Let's try as Nagius. Just taking the exact same command here. This one should work, and we should be getting an email soon. We'll give it some time, but I'm sure it'll arrive in a moment. In the meantime, we can keep talking. So that was one example, and soon enough, Nagius is going to bombard us with a bunch of messages. Uh, so to recap, what we've done is basically first uh, check how uh, emails are sent through Nagius, which is perfectly customizable. So another uh, way around uh, the problem would be to actually configure the sending command in Nagius to use a different email address. That's less generic, and sometimes that's what you would like. But usually, you, you probably want the machine to, to send all emails using the same method. Uh, and then we went into the uh, checking. We checked that the MTA is actually running. We've used Netstat for that. Uh, Netstat in Linux has very nice flags like these. On other Unices and on Windows, it does not have those. But there are other ways of checking. So you know, you could you, you could just do Netstat uh, AN, for example, in grep. Uh, I like this one because it actually shows you the process ID and the process name that is listening on, on that one. So it just it saves you a bit of uh, lookups. You know, it's just one command instead of a few, but it can be done on other Unices and, of course, on Windows as well, I suppose. Um, so we did that and we made sure it's running and then we tried using the command line sending an email and we failed. And then we went into the MTA log and we saw why and we corrected it. Okay, nice enough. Uh, now let's talk about what happens when ICMP is blocked. By default, uh, Nagis uses the check pin command, which is a, a default core plugin written in C, uh, in order to establish that there is connectivity with the host. Uh, however, a lot of hosts block ICMP for various reasons, and it's not always up to you to decide whether or not Nagis would be allowed to ping that particular host. Uh, so what you would do is, you would use uh, the check command directive in your host definition or host group, perhaps. Maybe you have a lot of these. And you can use an alternative command. So for example, you could say, uh, you know what, for this host, well, the most important thing to me in the world is that it has a listener on UDP on port 8080, for example. So what would happen then is that Nagius will use that check instead of the default ICMP one. Uh, let's uh, take a look. I actually did this configuration, so you can see here, no data received from, uh, from host, which is exactly the output of the check UDP plugin. Uh, a nice thing that we can do sometimes, and that's uh, quite a common scenario, 
you as a DevOps person would like to erect the Nagios environment way before actually services are deployed. So it may be that you're working on the infrastructure and the developers haven't even created that application that is listening on that port yet. But you want to establish network connectivity, you don't want to wait for them. So a very nice way to do that would be using Netcat. Uh, with Netcat, I can, I can do this and I can say, uh, when, any, when anyone tries to connect to this host uh, using UDP, that's minus U, over port 8080, just output LS. And if indeed I try to use Netcat from this side, okay, this is my host. And you see that we printed out the LS output for the root directory. So that's a very nice way to, to test things. Uh, if you don't have an actual demon listening yet. Uh, and of course, once you're done, it closes the connection. So it's only a one-time thing. I have to restart it if I want to check again. So that's a very, a very good way. By the way, the reason for not using Telnet, for example, is that it's over UDP, whereas Telnet only knows TCP. So you can't do that. And Netcat is, is a good alternative for that. Okie doke. So if I do start the listener here and seeing how I'm able to reschedule tests at the moment. Or not. Let's restart the Nagi daemon again. Because once you make the change, okay, you see that it has dubbed up data, which is good, but you need to reload the Nagi daemon for that. And possibly Apache too, we'll just do both. All right. Let's go to hosts, let's find this one, and lovely. Okay, and now it's green. It will become red again in a moment, and this is because Nagios now established the connection, and so the connection would close. If we go to the shell of that machine, see, it, it shouldn't have a listener at the moment if I do this, that's that command again, and look up that port, it's gone. Okay, I'll have to restart it if I want Nagios to succeed again. This is not meant as a permanent solution, it's just for testing. Because uh, oftentimes, the team that does, let's say, the networking and the team that does the development can work in parallel. So if there's a networking problem, there's really no reason to wait for the developers to configure their daemon uh, in, before you start doing the connectivity tests. So this is good for a scenario like that. Um, Another option would be for me to decide that the most important test for me is to uh, check that the web server on a particular host is listening instead of that UDP test. So I have here uh, if our video platform installed. We can open it up too. I'm going to log in and stuff. So this is, our, our platform is also a lamp shop, so it's running over Apache using PHP. And uh, and it's used for open source video platforms. Hold on there. I'll, I'll remember the password that I used here. Oh, I think it was. Um, Okay, goody, I suppose. All right, so let's say that the most important thing for me, since this machine only does Kaltura, is that uh, our API is responding to a ping command. Uh, our API is RESTful. I actually gave a session about, uh, about it last year. I don't know if anyone attended. Uh, so we can just send uh, HTTP commands back and forth and you know, get back XML information. So let's say that the most important thing for me in the world for this machine, seeing how it does not reply to ICMP, I can just do the check culture of pink. Let's see how I've defined that one. So we can just take a look at the configuration. Okay, that's a host. Um, where did I put it? Okay, so um, I've actually written uh, an initial check that just does CRL 
to that host address and returns. Uh, the way it would work is, for example, let's say my host is and not found, that's nice. Yep, indeed, thank you, whoever that was. <laughs> okay, so that just returns an XML, and we can see the result is one and one is good. So that's, that's, one, way of, that's one way of monitoring it, uh, but let's say that uh, I don't want to do that, and the reason why is because uh, it can, using CRL, you can actually, you can make it return a bad uh, um, RC if you didn't get uh, HTTP 200 easily by, by doing minus F. Let's uh, give a non-valid address. See, so it, it, does, it does return badly, and the return code is 22. But uh, what you can't do using just a simple CRL is to tell it to fail if I get something like, uh, hold on, that's the wrong IP address here. Yeah. Okay. See, so this one gave 200 because it did get a response, but I was trying to call a non-existent service called uh, Sysm, and Nagus wouldn't pick up on that because CRL would return 200. That's not good. Uh, what I'm going to use is a different thing, which is our client libraries that are CLI. We extend a bunch of client libraries, and one of those is, is CLI. So what you can do with that, uh, it's kind of neat, actually. is to do some checks without actually programming that much, which is good for things like testing. So see, I can do this, and it'll return just one, which is the part of the XML. And this one wouldn't return uh, RC0 unless it actually succeeded. So that's a better monitoring for me than CRL, which would return correctly even if the XML says error, error, non-existing API, and so forth. So this is what I wanted to explain. Let's move on. Next thing we have, and we're actually about to run out of time, unfortunately, uh, so I'll just show this one real quick and then we break for questions, is the capture command output. Uh, let me uh, show you the code for that, but first let's talk about what it does in, in broad lines. It's really a very short script, but it's quite useful. What it does is it wraps around the Nagus command. It gets back the result, and then it decides uh, depending on the return code, what to return back to Nagus. Nagus has a problem that we'll see in a moment where it doesn't know how to handle anything that is above RC3. Anything, any other return code would just uh, display uh, an error message saying out of bounds and I don't know what to do and red, red, red. And that's a bit hard to debug. So what we do is we use a very simple trick. Let me show you the, the plugin, uh, which I must say is uh, it's, it's my spin-off on, on, on someone else's plugin. It's not originally my idea. Uh, this gentleman here has, has come up with the original idea, but I wasn't able to track him down to get him to take my patches, so I had to fork it. Um, so basically what I did uh, is, uh, with, is changing his original so that, firstly, if it can't log to the log file, it'll exit with unknown. Secondly, I changed the permissions he originally gave, uh, 777, which is not only not necessary, but also quite dangerous. Uh, so I changed that one, and I did some cleanup. It's a Perl script, but the idea is very simple, and you could essentially accomplish it with any programming language you'd like. What it does is very simple. Uh, here's the log file, and it takes in arguments. So it takes in the actual command, the return code, output and so forth, it's declaring the variables, which will be used in a moment, takes in the number of args, escapes them, okay, this is basically generating the command line, we'll see it in the login moment, and then uh, generates a timestamp, okay, and this is the important part, basically runs it, makes a, a system call and runs it from the shell. 
What it does, though, which is important, is directing every STD error into STD out, and then logging that onto a file. It does a bit of handling here, so that if the log file cannot be opened, then unknown is returned. Same thing for closing it. Changes the permission of the log file, seeing how it may contain very sensitive information. And this is a bit of a magical part where it says, OK, if my return code from running that script is bigger than three, then print out the original RC, the return code, print out the output, the original output, and return three to Nagus so that Nagus can portray that message instead of just out of bounds, blah, 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 blah. And then uh, if that didn't happen, I mean, if the return code is OK, if it's between uh, zero and three, then just print out the output as usual and you know exit with the original return code. That's what it does. Uh, the log for that would look like this. So it's very easy to just pick it up like so and run it from the command line. So that's a very useful debugging tool. And it also makes uh, the lives of those looking at the web interface, which is not necessarily you, much easier, because here it is. See what it'll do? It'll say, um, let's try to, there we go. It'll, it'll give the actual error for the plugin. And the configuration for it is super simple. All you have to do is go to where you've defined the command, uh, in my case here, and just Use capture plugin before all the other arguments. That's all, you, that's all it takes. It's very simple to do. Uh, of course, if you keep it that way forever, you should remember to rotate that log file because it, it can get rather big. Or else you can just use it when you need to debug stuff. So it's very non-intrusive and can give you quite useful information without having to, you know. So if, for example, I'm to remove this one and just not use capture plugin, And I'll reload Nagis. Sorry. And I'll reschedule the test. And soon enough, it should show something quite ugly instead. There we go. Okay. So this is not useful. And when using the plugin, useful information. Not useful. Let's make it useful again. And it will clear up while I'm talking. <laughs> OK, so this is the capture command output uh, plugin. I'll also put it on Exchange. Uh, I actually did, but they haven't authorized, approved it yet because they're busy at the conference. And way to go now, these guys, for the awesome conference as well. Oh, they're clapping for the other room. That's great. <laughs> um, so that's the out of bound problem, and this is how you can solve it. I think I'm almost out of time, so I couldn't go through all the other scenarios, but again, you can look, at, look it up at the GitHub repository and look at the presentation as well. Uh, I write my presentations with LaTeX, so you can even find the original file with the, <laughs> with the LaTeX, and you can use it freely and have fun. Um, I'll break for questions now, I suppose. All right, thank you, Jess. Anyone with any, any uh, questions or comments? Now's the time to ask, folks. Jess, do you have anything that uh, you're currently working on, any upcoming projects or anything that you're excited about for this year? Um, well, you know, I'm always excited about my, my work for Kultura. Uh, we're an open source video platform, and uh, we're looking for volunteers as well. So if you're interested in, in that area, I'll be happy to talk to you and, you know, demo if you'd like and get your contributions if you're into that. Uh, I, I'll open our main project page as well while I'm talking. Um, otherwise, you know, uh, doing my work, uh, sometimes committing stuff to Nagis Exchange. That's all. Any other questions? I was this clear. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Basically, you just said about volunteering Kaltura. I've, I've been seeing Kaltura for a while and, and just wondering what kind of volunteering are you thinking about or what are you doing in that sort? 
Um, yeah, sure. So I'm, I'm the technical community manager and packaging lead for Cultura CE. That's the community edition. And the code is open source, and we're always looking for more people to join the project and you know, make pull requests, uh, suggest ideas, and, and so forth and so on. So um, it's an open project on GitHub. Uh, you're welcome to look at the documentation. You're welcome to speak to me directly if you'd like. And we're looking for anything from uh, docu documentation writing, uh, development, patching, QAing, any kind of feedback would be very welcomed. Thank you. Sure. Thank you. Looks like we got enough time for our one or two more here. Anyone else, uh, any questions? I just want to say that uh, what you've just shown us today is exactly why I come to these conferences, because this type of information is priceless, and I don't know where else I could learn this. So thank you. Oh, wow. Uh, thanks. I'm, I'm, I'm touched. <laughs> Very well said. All right, ladies and gentlemen, once again, Jess, uh, Jess Portnoy. Congratulations. Thank you.